I'm affiliated, for those of you that don't know too much about me, to a, an organization called the European Council of Princes. It's a constitutional body, it comprises 33 sovereign houses, and, and it really operates as a sort of parliamentary buffer between dictates and what people will or will not be subjected to. I was approached simply because of that, not because of my new book, by an organization that I'd never heard of before, considering all of my years of involvement, I'd never heard of them. They were called the Imperial Court of the Dragon Sovereignty. What were the earliest aims and ambitions of the order? See here, they said, this is what we were set up to do, and this comes from 2000 BC, to perpetuate and advance the scientific strength of the royal family. Cain was important, we discover, because he's actually the son, not of Adam and Eve, but of Enki and Eve. We actually have here, if we use the word that they used, the word clone or clone, the branch, we have a second stage in the cloning fertilization process. We have now not only a contrived, a partly contrived Eve who is 50% Anunnaki, we now have Eve and Enki who is fully Anunnaki and a son that turns out, according to the records, to be at least three quarters Anunnaki. We have a man who's very much approaching a God figure himself. It then tells us that the Lord placed a mark upon Cain to save him from his enemies. A seven-fold vengeance. Who was the Lord? The Lord was not Jehovah. The Lord was his brother, Enki. So we find, in fact, what the dragon court has recorded for all time. Something called the first count of arms in sovereign history, when Lord Enki grants to his son the Baal, the Grail, the Mark of Cain. What is the Mark of Cain? It is the most simplest of all sovereign devices. It is very simply, and the Phoenician records tell us this, the early Hebrew records tell us this, the Mesopotamian records tell us this, and they all tell us the same. It is very simply an upright red cross within a circle. The other interesting thing is that we discover that every time what, what we might think of as blood drinking or blood eating is referred to in the early days in the dietary stories, the sign that always gets presented to us is the red cross in the circle. Now, crosses in circles mean a lot of things, but red crosses in the circle are always tied up with this particular ritual, the dew cup, the cup of the waters, the rosicrucius. So why dragons? We know that the Messiah was a dragon. We know that the crocodile was the root of the dragon. We know that the dragon order was founded in 2200 BC. We know that the word dragons and pendragons actually comes from way back about 3800 BC. Why isn't the symbol a dragon? Why is the symbol this red cross? Well, in actual fact, one discovers that the symbol is a dragon. The red cross, the dew cup, is a dragon. The circle it transmits is a serpent clutching its own tail, creating everlasting, the unity. So suddenly, the dragon is linked with the dew cup, is linked with the holy grail, and it's why the grail kings were still called in the Middle Ages pendragons. The symbol was the same, and as one progresses through history and follows the red cross symbol, it gradually emerges that this is actually a dragon, and it's more pictorially displayed, but it was always that. It was always a dragon, and the dragon was called Draco, Draco the dragon. It was the emblem of the pharaohs, the dragon. It was the emblem of the Egyptian therapeutate at Qumran in the time of Jesus. It was the Bistia Neptunis, the great sea serpent of the Merovingian fisher kings in France. And it is the emblem of most of the royal families today, somewhere on their coats of arms, the dragon, Draco. Draco is identical as a dragon with serpent, because there's little relation between these fire-breathing, winged dragons that we see in nursery rhyme 
The dragon was originally more like a crocodile. It was a four-legged, rather large, snouted serpent. Serpent and dragon were absolutely identical, and it didn't really matter which word was used. It meant the same thing. The dragon, the holy crocodile, the messa, the messiah. The word serpent is used many, many times in the Bible. It starts off with the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent in the garden. Dragon in the garden. Every time we see the word serpent in the Bible, when we look back at the original Hebrew writings to see what it was translated from, it was translated from a word that would vowels in it comes to something like Nahash. N-H-S-H continentally. The word meant to decipher. It meant to divine. It meant to find out. It had nothing whatever to do with snakes. The dragon was always he who held the knowledge. He who from one found out he whom could divine, and that is the root of why we call gods and deities divine, because they held the roots of the serpent, or the nahash, to the divining, they had the knowledge, they had the knowing, they were the kings, and the serpent of the garden, we are told, was Enki. They were wisdom, they were healing, they were knowledge. It's interesting to discover, once one starts to look, how often serpents and dragons appear in motives of, of healing institutions today. The American Medical Association is actually the plant of life, a tree, star, with a widening serpent around it. In the early days, therefore, we're looking at something that is going to evolve into a an area, a specific area, of what we later became to call alchemy. It's not the whole of alchemy, it's a little part of it. But we can now see where it's going. We can now see that we're dealing with a natural substance that eventually has to become a purposely contrived drug, for want of a better word, something else. Because actually, this Anaki Starfire is not going to be around forever, which it wasn't. What does starfire do? It produces hormonal secretions. Who were the people that knew about these secretions? They were the people who knew these secretions. It's where the word secret comes from. It comes from the early priests, the temples of the dragon court, who kept the secret, the secretions, and this was one of the key, key secrets, really, of the early mystery schools was the upholding of the starfire ritual. It is one of the secrets that Freemasonry says have been lost. They know that there's a secret somewhere back in ancient Egypt and Samaria, but they're not quite sure what it is. Well, this is one of the secrets, the secret of the secretion of the ritual of the ritual. It had all sorts of names. It was nectar of the gods. It was gold of the gods. It was also called the ceremony of the light.
we're moving into areas that we begin to understand here, the way to the light. Following the light, we suddenly look at the, the, the Essene records and, and the records from the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatever, and suddenly we're into a whole new scheme of operations which is pursuing the roots of the light. The light, when we look at back at the old records, actually was the star fire. The star fire is about the acquisition of ability to have special knowledge and wisdom. This is the light. This is the star fire. This is the root to it. And that had gone because it had been taken away. We're now looking for it. The light, it is said, exists in everybody. It simply has to be awakened. There are various ways of awakening it, but the natural way we are told in the oldest records I can find is simply by will. Self-will is the root to the light, a thought-free consciousness, a plane of pure being. And they called this plane of pure being the plane of Sharon. It was actually this very concept of being, being through the starfire, being I am that I am, that became the problem for Jehovah when the edict against blood was issued. Even after Adam was said to have taken from the tree and eaten of the fruit, God in the Bible, Jehovah says, look here guys, the man has become one of us. Those are the words. Nearly. Behold, actually. Behold. <laughs> That's the sort of stuff God said. Behold. He has become one of us. He has taken from the plant of life. He has taken the starfire. He has taken the fruit. The teachings of the early dragon school are very, very specific about being or self-completeness. It was the key to everything that this succession was built up on. It's actually not too far adrift from what you guys are about today. You're doing it through a very different means, but what in actual fact you are doing is through the type of training that you're going through and type of processes that you put your own minds through. You are actually, in your own way, creating higher production of these hormonal secretions which are enabling you to, to, to move into higher realms than there would be norm in terms of cultural thinking. Behold, said Jehovah, man is one of us. A couple of pictorial images here just to remind you of a couple of things. This is the image we know for medical associations throughout the world. Pineal gland, brain's ventricles, spinal column, nervous system. This comes from old starfire ritual. It is what we associate today with medical institutions. What we also associate today with healing and emergency services is the Rosicrucius, the Red Cross. All of these old symbols are that old. And they exist today in medicine, in healing, in emergency services, and in everything to do with looking after people. Caneship. <laughs>